Welcome to our webinar, Unleash Your End User Computing Potential in 2024. Focus on how to accelerate value across your enterprise. I'm Brian Wagner, the Practice Director of End User Computing and Cloud at Gotham. I'm joined with some awesome people here today, uh, both from Citrix and Nutanix. So I will hand it over to Jeremy to introduce himself. Thank you, sir. So uh, I'm Jeremy Myers. I, I actually manage the uh, the pre-sales practice here um, at Cloud Software Group or Citrix. Obviously, we've had some changes this year, um, you know, on the East Coast in Canada. Uh, so I work directly with partners such as Gotham. Gotham is uh, by far one of my most important partners that I do work with. Um, but we're also joined here with the, uh, the one and only Kevin Bacon. Hi, everybody. Kevin Bacon from Nutanix. My role is at End-User Computing Solutions Architect, and um, I'm happy to be with you guys today. Great. I think, uh, you know, we wanted to walk through a bit of a case study, um, you know, just kind of explain some of how we've seen customers get the value out of, out of these solutions. So, uh, um, Anita, I don't know if you can pop up that slide and then uh, maybe Jeremy will walk us through this a little bit. I'll have it right up. Excellent. Yeah, so this is a, uh, so this is a, we, so we thought we'd start with a case study because, you know, I think most folks kind of want to get a sense of how other, you know, other organizations are actually leveraging the solution, solving problems. Um, you know, I think the Citrix, Nutanix, Gotham solution um, is unique, you know, in our space. Um, and we'll get to a lot of that later, but you know, we wanted to touch on healthcare. Um, yeah, I think in, at least in our space, healthcare is by far one of our largest verticals, uh, most important verticals. You know, we like to say, um, well, I don't say this because it sounds pretentious. We save lives, but it's a very important um, you know use case for us. So, you know, we have a hospital, um, you know, in the New York metro area that um, that leveraged uh, Gotham to help build out architect a solution that involved, you know, Nutanix um, and, you know, in Citrix is, is a part of the solution. Um, you know, I think their initial use case, just to give you some background here, was um, you had a use case that they were using internally, which was VPN based. The idea was um, they had clinicians uh, and practitioners uh, remoting into their own des desktops, right? So, you know, think about a PC sitting in a cubicle, you know, what does it take? to remotely access that, you know, they're using RDP. Um, you know, as someone who's been doing this for 20 years, I've seen this a lot. Um, it's not particularly scalable, it works, it's not particularly scalable. Uh, and most importantly, it ties up some real estate. So, you know, when you think about that PC in a cubicle someone's remoting to, it's great, but no one else can use it. So you pair that with VPN. Um, I think we've got a lot of organizations trying to maybe replace their VPN solutions. You know, this customer came to us thinking, hey, you know, I think we've got a, um, We've got an opportunity to maybe rethink how we're approaching this. And so they landed on the Citrix on Nutanix solution. And Brian and his team were the ones who architected this together. So the idea was let's replace the VPN, let's free up our real estate, let's host this on a Nutanix cluster, you know, sitting back in the data center. Um, and let's just make it scalable. So maybe with our limited number of you know physical desktops, this is something that we can number one you know replace these these PCs, run it in the data center, and actually be able to support um, you know more user base, and, and honestly scale it out a little bit easier. So with, now it's easier to take on new users and and maybe provide a better user experience as folks travel around. So um, as a part of that, you know we'll talk about Citrix DAS, you know we'll talk about the Nutanix piece. But Brian, let me kick this over to you. Just you know from Gotham's perspective, how do you approach maybe a, an opportunity or a use case like this um, when you're when Gotham's, you know, organizing and architecting this. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is actually pretty common. I know we're talking healthcare here, but um, but we're seeing this kind of need at a lot of our customers where, you know, you used to have desks tied to a single individual and 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 that's not really the desire anymore. They want a little bit more flexible space. People are working um, maybe not every day in the office. Right. And, and want that flexibility to maybe move around, right, and, and not tie up, as you were saying, that desk to, to somebody. So this the use case itself is is actually something that we're it's really resonating with with a lot of our customers um, and, and kind of moving to more of a hoteling type type of space, even if it's almost every day people now might be using the same, but they might not be right. And, and again, not tying up and using that computer that's at that desk as more of a, a thin client to connect back to 
a virtual desktop or and connect to your application securely. So from that perspective, um, you know, just from an approach, I, I think Citrix and you know Nutanix, as far as providing the the, the platform to run it on, um, you know, really offers a, a very nice solution. And some of the other nice to haves or you know benefits that that came out of this specifically were just. You know, obviously, if that PC is is shut down or or down for unreachable for whatever reason, um, you know, it, it becomes very difficult. You know, if someone's got to run over, power things on, right? Having a virtual desktop infrastructure to be able to support that scenario and um, ensuring that um, you know, even if there's outages, even within the infrastructure, um, you know, we're able to withstand those types of things, and that's and that's something that. Um, that I think the solution brings, but, but as far as approach, you know, understanding the real. The real um, job we do is really understand the use case, right? You know, what are we trying to accomplish? What are those users access? What do they need? And and how do we craft a solution that's going to provide the least amount of management and overhead and be able to support the use case, you know, and, and I think that's, this is a good example of where we did that. We had a lot of commonality amongst um, departments of users, right? And we were able to come together on images and applications and really um, reduce the overall administration for an environment like this compared to what it was before. And, um, and then offer all the value of not only being able to access it um, remotely, but being able to access it remotely from um, from more places, right? You don't need this VPN client that probably had a lot of um, requirements to be on an asset and other things that we can now offer in a, in a more flexible way using Citrix and, and, and Nutanix. So yeah, let me jump in there, Brian. Let me jump in there, Brian, because I, I think the, the important thing and to your point, Jeremy, what you were saying is you know flexible and scalable. It's it's so critical, and I think time and time again, you know, Citrix solutions in particular, in particular, and I think Nutanix, you know, accelerates this. There's any time there's an there's an issue in 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 the way you know users have to work, right? So we've seen that with hurricanes. I mean, I, I went through Hurricane Sandy in the Northeast. Uh, we saw that with the pandemic. I mean, we see that even just even just on a, a snow day, or I mean, so 2020, we're talking about twenty twenty four. It's also going to be an election year, so uh, you know, there's always going to be you know political situations and, and things like that that you want to be you want to be ready for, right? And I think those type of Citrix solutions, when they're when they're you know cloud based and you can deliver to anywhere um, and have a great user experience is so critical for those situations. I mean, we saw that obviously with the pandemic, I remember hurricane Sandy, there was a financial services uh, client that was downtown in Manhattan and th their solution was something similar to this. It was, you know, remote accessing to their physical desktop. Well, the, well, during hurricane Sandy, the, the basement flooded, they couldn't access the building. Uh, they had, they, they had a like 200 people in a chain taking physical desktops down 50 flights of stairs. Uh, in buildings so that people could actually get to their PCs. You know, people that are running on Citrix and Tannis were not doing that, right? So, I mean, that's, so I think that's part of what we mean by flexible and scalable is that you can, um, and I think the scalable part of it is interesting too, because what we're seeing a lot, I mean, um, uh, you know, Brian, you mentioned kind of the, the hybrid nature now that's more common is also being able to say, okay, you know, if, if, if you only need a few, a few virtual desktops or a few apps, that's good, but you also want to have a platform where you can quickly scale that out. If all of a sudden you have um, a, a new acquisition, we have a we have a customer now. Uh, there was a couple of banks that 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 basically nearly failed, right? Like or this year, um, and so there was some some acquisitions. So we're working with some of those clients too, right? To figure out, okay, now we've got this 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 new you know entity that's now part of the same. How do we how do we deliver the same applications, the same desktops? And do that very quickly, right? No one wants to spend years on these on these kind of projects. So I think those are just critical to the way business is being done. So what's sort of interesting about you know the Citrix Nutanix, Nutanix solution, like it's not unusual. In fact, you know this particular use case could have been born out of um, COVID. I'm not 100% familiar on you know how the VPN started, but in a lot of cases, to your point, Kevin, it was a uh, Hey, let's get something up and running. This made sense, and oh, oh by the way, afterwards it just became the the way people worked. But you know, if folks are rethinking this, and some of the challenge, especially if you're new to VDI, uh, or at least new to architecting this, is there are a lot of components, right? I mean, listen, you're you're trying to figure out what the hardware looks like. In a lot of cases, I have stores that I need to run. There's a networking component to this. There's the hypervisor. There is, you know, the Citrix piece itself. You know, what's delivering the desktops, and so. You know, in a lot of organizations, you know, operationally, it can be a lot to take on all at once. So, you know, I think one of the, 
the big values, uh, and this is what I love about Nutanix, is it hides a lot of that. And I say hide it, it's not that it's not there, but you know, I think Nutanix takes a different approach to things like storage, network, and compute, and now the hypervisor. Like what sets that apart from maybe some of the traditional three-tier uh, architectures we've used in the past, and how does it make it easy? You know, I think, you know, I, I like to joke, honestly, I think Citrix on Nutanix is kind of an easy button. How do we make that easy? Like, what does that look like? Well, I think, you know, traditionally, if you're going to do Citrix, you've got to figure out the hypervisor, the storage, the compute, the networking. And traditionally, those were various different silos in the data center and different vendors were providing those solutions. So with Nutanix, the first thing we do is we consolidate all that down. So it's it's one compute platform. It's it, It's got a built-in hypervisor. It's got the built-in storage. Uh, and even even more and more than networking, we can swallow up, especially now with our Cisco relationship, we're doing ACI, we've got our own um, uh, uh, micro segmentation and virtual networking stack in, in, inside our stack as well. Um, so we're just making all of that where, and frequently we're having, uh, you know, really the EUC, the desktop, the virtual desktop um, um, engineers, uh, really managing the whole stack for the first time that I've ever seen. Uh, with, with Nutanix because they realize there's really not a whole lot to really manage here and they can actually have more control of delivering that, that excellent user experience if they don't need to rely on five different teams to figure out what the issue is or, or what the slowness is and that, those kind of things. And so I, th I think that's, that's, the, that's the first part of it. Uh, I don't know, Brian. What What do you think? Is that is that what yeah, you think as well? Yeah, I think there's a lot of key points there. I have. I, I think that's a challenge that a lot of my customers, enterprise customers, uh, maybe more so than than others, where everything is really split siloed and just troubleshooting gets very very difficult. And and some of them are providing kind of like an internal service, like, hey, I gave you storage, right? You know, like you're you're just you know like it's a black box. You don't know you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know what platform you're on. You don't know you know. Uh, what what kind of disks are underneath you, et cetera, right? They don't want you to know. Do you do you see the disk or not? You know, yes, it's there, but you know, but beyond that, it gets difficult. So I think, um, it, you know, you, you really brought up a good point around kind of consolidating um, the administration of it, but also that that kind of leads to the consolidating the support, right? Having one one you know company to call for support and being able to kind of talk through all those layers and not, you know, not have to bring different people into that or different solutions into that. I think really just what we've seen is really cut down on the, the time to troubleshoot and remediate, you know, any issues that do arise. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of benefit there. Um, and I've definitely gotten that feedback from customers that, you know, hey, this used to be kind of like I used to depend on these other people, but I really didn't know what was happening. I didn't have eyes on it. I, I, I couldn't really get into the weeds with it the way that they wanted to when they're managing a kind of end to end um, solution like this. Uh, so, you know, another thing that typically comes up as well. So, you know, you got your solution in place. Um, number one, how do I architect? How do I size it? That's thing number one, right? So, you know, most organizations will, will come and say, hey, listen, I'm trying to support 300 users, 500 users out of the gate. If this goes well, you know, I could see us expanding this up to, you know, well over a thousand, right? So this is a very scalable solution. But um, I guess without leading the horse to water, like how do you architect? How do you size that? Yeah. And is it predictable in the future is really what it boils down to. So if I'm a, an IT manager and I'm trying to think six months out, nine months out, even a year out, like how do I budget for that? You know, is it easy to do? Uh, it can be difficult. I think with this solution, it gets a lot easier just because um, there's there's growth that you can apply linearly. You know, so in other words, as you add more users, you can add more nodes into this kind of solution that will give you more compute, will automatically give you more storage and uh, more capacity overall in general, right? And then and beyond that, um, you know, I think we, we touched on it a little bit, but, you know, when we, you know, the burst scenario, like what do we do when we make an acquisition that no one told me that was coming, you know, and now I got to deal with it, right? And that's where I think the, the, the ability for the Nutanix platform to scale into cloud is something that can provide us a consistent, you know, administration platform for it, but the ability to extend out into the same, you know, the same platform really living in AWS or Azure or wherever, you know, wherever our customer would like to scale to. So I, I think there's a couple pieces there that kind of, you know, that might be a short term thing while they acquire more hardware on prem that might, you know, there might be different scenarios that we can attack, but those are, those are some things that I think are pretty unique on, on being able to provide that, that, that's that similar platform across um, different public and private clouds. 
All right. Yeah, I think listen, ultimately, we'll... let me yeah, let sorry. me jump in there, Jeremy. I think ultimately we're trying to offer a cloud-like services that are portable across your own data center or data centers, as well as AWS and Azure, and maybe more clouds in the future. So, you know, we think of that you know compute infrastructure as code or as a service. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, for us, you know, we the the big differentiator from what we did the way we designed Nutanix compared to the older model with with the, with this you know with with the SAN is with the SAN there's 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 a single place where all your storage is going right and that's all where all your storage traffic is right and you've got that high bandwidth connection with Nutanix every server that you that you run your your virtual desktops on is all also a storage controller and so what that means is that there's no bottlenecks in the architecture and it's it's designed so that Every time you're adding another server, you're also adding the extra storage processing and you're adding the extra um, networking and you're adding the extra, um, usually like a few more NVMe drives to take care of the, the actual disk you know, capability for that. So you're basically adding all of the, the ingredients you need for that virtual desktop in a linear manner. So we no longer have to do the traditional like pod architectures or pod scaling where you say, okay, for 4,000 desktops, you need to buy this you know, rack of, of kit. It's just, hey, for every additional 100 users, buy one more server. Uh, and just and the system will, will automatically ingest that into the cluster and image it for you and, and add all, all that capabilities into it for you. So we've had that for on-prem, but then we had the supply chain issues, right? After COVID, it was, you know, how fast can we get, you know, uh, you, you know servers and switches and all that kind of fun stuff. And so right at the same time, we were also announcing where we can now take that Nutanix software that we traditionally run in a data center on, you know, whatever servers you, you, want, you want, you prefer. Now we can run that in bare metal in AWS and Azure. So now what used to be, you know, it used to be the bottleneck was in terms of speed was how fast we can ship you servers. And that was typically around three weeks. And today it's about three weeks. But with supply chain, you know, things, it, it could obviously go a lot longer than that. Um, but now we can say, if you need a short-term need, we can light that up and using your cloud accounts, using your AWS or Azure account, um, your consumption, we can d- just layer that on top of uh, bare metal. So you can, you can, you know, launch that in, in under an hour, right? Anywhere in the world. Uh, and then just, and then just have that built-in replication and, 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 and uh, automation cap- capabilities to, 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 and, and Citrix sees it exactly the same. That's what's, what one thing is really neat. So it's, it's the same stack it's the same hypervisor that we run in a data center so to citrix it looks exactly the same so there's nothing to change uh from the citrix side and that includes citrix cloud um or citrix on-prem and that also includes mcs and pvs right so you can have all those different architectures and that's all just going to work uh right away yeah uh, we're going to actually start some polling just so you guys uh you know kind of see that we'll uh, we'll get some things moving um I guess you know we already we already saw something a little you know pop up there. So it seems like you know have, has anyone encountered issues with performance, with VDI and infrastructure, right? And I think we've been kind of uh, tackling a little bit of that conversation here. But um, but you know this is something we get a lot, right? Uh, just trying to understand how do we how do we deal with performance issues, you know? And and we kind of talked a little bit about how troubleshooting gets easier, right? When you're working in this type of solution where things are consolidated and there's you know, kind of less fingers to point, right? You know, and, and everybody's, uh, you, you, you know, everybody's involved. Um, it's a smaller group of people that need to be involved from an administration. Um, but really, how, you know, I, I think the trick is how have we have we dealt with it, right? You know, and 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 um, some of these things also kind of lead into the cloud conversation too, because when we talk about cloud, we're 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 boxed into the kind of t-shirt sizes that are that are generally when we're talking native cloud, right? We have uh, you know. Two CPU, four gig, four CPU, eight gig, whatever, whatever T-shirt sizes they offer is what we need to kind of adhere to. Um, and one of the nice features, I think, when we talk about what Nutanix offers in public cloud is the ability to provide the exact same kind of specs that you would on on premise and get full full um, um, ability to take care of all the capacity you have there, right? So we we talk a little bit about micro waste, right? The the you know these little wasted CPU because we gave two extra CPU because we needed more memory for that person, or we gave a little more um, you know uh, more memory and we you know uh, more CPU and it ended up giving them more memory than they need. So in this scenario, we can really fine tune exactly what you offer um, and and have consistency across what you offer in your 
on-premise environment and cloud. So, so, you know, I think some of those kind of help us tackle that performance by ensuring that we right-size things and actually give the ability to, um, um, you know, uh, provision the proper CPU and memory and storage <laughs> for, for that use case. Yeah, and I think it's similar between the pod architecture type approach or the t-shirt sizes is like, that works really well if your workloads and your users fit exactly into that pre, you know prescribed sizing but as soon as you want 10 percent more performance <laughs> you got to go double you got you got to you know go up to the next which is double the yep, capability double and the also cost. double the price yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so then you're in this weird position where do you want to give are you want to just sacrifice that 10 percent performance and people are going to be frustrated or do you want to double the cost you know so you're in kind of that lose lose type type uh you know bargain there all right so i had to vote by the way in order to see the polls so the polls out there i was going to say brian kevin you guys aren't allowed to vote but um in order to see what's out there you're gonna to have to vote so i skewed it i did say yes that's not fair because of course you know i have a bird's eye view of a lot of these but you know, listen, performance with VDI and infrastructure, um, not uncommon. Um, in fact, Kevin, that was the, the other day when you told me about micro waste, um, it like immediately made sense. You know, so I've been going out to Azure, I've been going out to AWS, I've been spinning up a workload only to find out that that instance type that AWS says I need, the only way to get more is to, to buy the version that's like double that. Um, whereas what you're talking about is, you know, I've got my, hypervisor my AHV, my acropolis running on my on prem i can extend that out bare metal to a to a cloud so i'm running AHV in the cloud and i think that does a couple of different things one it gives you the granularity you just described i can add that 10 percent of performance but it sounds like it can also probably i don't have to refactor workloads i can easily move back and forth and you know simplify burst you know that sort of use case out to the public clouds using the same you know, management stack I'm used to. Is that right? Yeah, and this has been, and to your point, this has been the fastest growing area of Nutanix. And, you know, this is where there's a lot of excitement right now because we're one of the few companies in the space that can even come close to this. And I think, and the way we do it, we're the only ones um, because we give you full control, right? So you're using your accounts. Um, you're not, you're not, we're not reselling like cloud services to you. You're not paying for like a managed service. Um, we're just providing the automation and you're, you, you own the whole, the whole stack. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, this, this has been one of the fastest growing and the fastest growing revenue too. I mean, we've already booked a deal for yeah, Azure yeah. that's, you know, eight figures. I mean, just, just incredible size. So there's incredible interest for customers. And that, that was Citrix, by the way, just, just running Citrix, um, in Azure, but running on, on top of the Nutanix stack. So there's just, uh, there's incredible interest right now for that. And we're going to, we're going to continue, you know, ramping this up. So we, we've got the polls and we've already got the first one out there. We also have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, please put those in the Q&A. Anita, I'm assuming that's open to everyone. Um, but of course, we'd like to get the juices going. So, you know, we've got a question or two. We thought we'd, um, you know, kind of get us started here. But if you've got anything, you know, we're going to try to start with the hard hitting ones, the ones that are usually on everyone's mind. But well, Jer usually... Jeremy, I got a question for you. All right. What you got? So, you know, Citrus went private, right? Cloud software group. And the big mm -hmm. message that I heard as part of that coming yes. out of that early this year was going, was going hybrid. It was a hybrid, you know, you know, cloud mm -hmm. software group is hybrid first. You guys have, you've been, you know, sharing that with customers and, and that new vision. What's been the response like? What, you know, how are customers embracing that kind of hybrid first messaging? What do you, and what do you, what do you see as different internally at Citrix now? Yeah, I think um, a lot of customers appreciate it. So for a seller who has been talking to customers for years about let's move to the cloud, let's move to the cloud. The fact that we said, you know what, land where you need to land, right? So, you know, Kevin, I think you told me cloud smart the other day. Um, Nutanix has such clever words, but, um, you know, your workloads <laughs> need to sit wherever your workloads need to sit, right? The idea is you're going to have some data center space that makes sense, you know. I have very few customers that have gone all the way to the cloud and then stayed there. They usually somehow back that down. I'm not saying that there are folks who do that, but, you know, I think in most enterprises that we work with, it's usually a mixture of clouds. It's a mixture of data centers. Um, you know, for some folks, they do go cloud. But um, you know, the idea is we're trying to meet customers where their journey is. I know it sounds very marketing, but the idea is, you know, Citrix has always been about being a bit agnostic 
you know, regardless of the hypervisor, regardless of the cloud, you know, we've taken it a step further and said, regardless of number one, the licensing, right? So now you can have a license, a license that will let you to, to deploy anywhere, um, host that management plane anywhere, um, you know, but to take it a step further, it's in perpetuity, you know, so you have a renew um, a universal license, you can run that anywhere. And on the flip side, just from an engineering perspective, you know, there were features and we kind of socialized this as the reason to go to a cloud management plane was there's certain things that only live in the cloud. Well, guess what? You know, we're engineering a lot of that and we're bringing it back to the on-premise product. So, you know, we have um, we've moved our on-prem studio. There's still an MMC, but we're making that a web studio. You know, a lot of the um, um, a lot of the products have been uplifted. They come on prem. There's a feature called auto scale, and this is something we've leveraged in the cloud for a while just to help customers manage costs in the cloud. Well, guess what? That's a piece that sits on prem as well now. So in your customer managed control plane, you've got things like auto scale. You can now, you know, hook into and, and manage workloads and resource locations that sit in the cloud from your on premise or better yet, what folks are doing is they're just lifting and shifting that control plane into the cloud because that's what they want to do. So that's one that's been sort of the shift. It's embracing that. Um, it's not just embracing it from a licensing perspective, but you know we're engineering for that as well. That's probably the biggest yep. shift. I was just going to chime in. I I, I think um, that flexibility is something that's really welcome. You know, by every customer conversation that I have, you know, they kind of felt this, you know, maybe push right. And some customers were were all about it. They were already moving the cloud. They had cloud workloads. Cloud, you know, having the management plane up there just made a lot of sense to them. And we have other customers that everything was on prem, and they kind of liked, you know hugging their servers every day and, you know, feeling that attachment where they can, they can troubleshoot things directly. They can look at event logs in that plane and they had built out the operational processes to manage it. Right. So the, the benefits of moving that away really weren't as, as, you know, uh, as apparent than maybe some other customers who really are in that more cloud first type of mentality. So, um, you know, I, 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 and, you know, definitely feeling that that reinvestment in that on-prem environment and i think that you know we've already like the web console is so much better you know than than the mmc console and things like that that i think have made a material improvement to the product on-prem and people see that there is um you know that seems so they can really choose really what's best for them without giving up something you know which i felt like before it was like oh if you want anything new you got to go to cloud right you know like, mm -hmm. that's the only place you're going to get anything new right on-prem is like you know we're just going to let it die on the vine or something you know so now it's a it's a totally different mantra and and it, and it and it honestly happened pretty quick you know in reality we're we're less than a year you know from from when the acquisition took place and these things are available and they have been available actually for a while so i think that that's pretty cool to see the immediate change there and um and that effect has been has been positive for sure yeah, yeah and i think we've got it's hard for me to keep up just on brian's point it's honestly a little hard for me to keep up because We've reinvested. So the way we've organized the business now is in these business units, right? And so Netscaler, you know, they own Netscaler and, you know, just the engineering focus is a little bit different. It's so focused. Same thing on the Citrix BU side. So we're introducing these features so so quick that, you know, sometimes it's even hard for me. I'm staying on top of, of this best I can. But, you know, we announced this and all of a sudden, less than a year later, you know, we've got Web Studio on Prem. Yeah. Hey, by the way, fun fact, um, you know, studio has been MMC based. How old is, how old are MMCs? I just, I, I completely forget this because I've got four kids, time flies now, but you know, when was the first MMC introduced? I'm guessing Windows 2000. I don't know. Windows 2000 is 23 years old, almost 24 years old, Brian. Yeah. Just, just saying. Yep. But it was tough. Yeah. Well, you guys, to go back to what you were saying though, too, about customers that want to move back and forth. I mean, we've got one customer, um, they were spending a million dollars a month on AWS um, services. I think they were, were an early customer. They did exactly what you were saying, Jeremy. They did a, kind of a lift and shift of their Citrix um, mm -hmm. to AWS. The bill was was insane. So we helped them bring all that back onto Nutanix and then AHV with Citrix. And so, and they've been, you know, super happy with that large, large customer. Um, and then we have customers, like I said, that, that earlier one, that's, that's we're helping them get to Azure. Right. So they, they want to be out of the data center completely and they're going they're going to Azure. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see, like, to your point, that flexibility. Um, Brian, what you were saying, like customers really appreciate that because, um, you know, um, the calculations change a lot in terms of, you know, where a lot of these workloads need to land. And uh, it's great if you have that system. And to, I think you were also saying, too, about how the features like it's it's 
uh, Brian, you have a good point, right? Like sometimes it feels like you almost have to go to the cloud to get whatever the new features are and capabilities. It almost seems like, okay, I, I have to do this. And uh, one of the great things about the way we've, we've designed how Nutanix runs in the data center and, and the new cloud offerings, or not that new really, but the newer is, uh, is it the same code base? It's literally the same installer uh, works for both. So any any new feature that we develop is gonna is is gonna hit both uh, at the same time. That's awesome. So I would say don't take our word for it, Anita. Can you put the next poll question up? Because I think this would be a this would be a good feel. Like let's listen from our peers here real quick and just see what folks are doing. So so what, what's your cloud strategy? Is it cloud first? Is it hybrid? Is it cloud averse? Is it cloud smart? And if you get confused around hybrid and cloud smart, I'm gonna let Kevin explain that because he had to school Brian and I the other day. There's a there's a subtle nuance there, but what's the difference between hybrid and cloud smart? Well, I think for me, um, you know, cloud first and cloud averse, right, means cloud first is like, I'm going to go all in cloud, doesn't matter the cost, doesn't matter, I'm not going to even have a data center anywhere, et cetera. Cloud averse is going to be the opposite of that, right? So I think, I think hybrid and cloud smart are a little bit more nuanced, like you said. I think Hybrid is, is what we're trying to offer where you can have the same management, the same stack, and have it uh, available in multiple clouds and multiple data centers. Um, so you have the, the ultimate and flexibility. I think Cloud Smart is more, there's certain workloads that are going to go in Azure native. There's certain workloads that are going to go in my on-prem stack, and they're not really going to be managed the same, right? It's going to be different workloads in different clouds. Um, so I think that's maybe maybe the difference there. So what's interesting about um, this question is it obviously means a different computing platform in a lot of cases, right? Um, depending on kind of what your your plan is and what your story is, at least that's something you could be considering. So, you know, I guess I'll pitch one over to you, Brian, here real quick. Here's a, here's a question. Have you seen interest in customers just looking to, um, you know, switch computing platforms? You might be unmuted. Yeah, Brian, it says you're, it doesn't say you're on mute, but. Oh, there you, there you go. go. Yeah, all right, I don't know if microphone fuck. It, um, it could have been me. Yeah, I think uh, in general, the compute, there are definitely inflection points, right? When we're looking at the compute platform of when you might have, um, you know, looking at hardware, you know, the, the, the um, servers and storage, right? And, and understanding when those might go, um, need to be replaced, right? And, and obviously those are inflection points to either looking at a, you know, a different platform like, like a Nutanix and, and, it's, and it, it, it actually reaches more than just the physical aspects of that, but really the hypervisor has been a big conversation for us. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of fear in, in, um, in some of the current state of, of VMware with, with the acquisition looming and, and, um, and potential cost increases. And, and we've definitely, you know, we've, we've We've definitely had seen a lot of questions arise or people looking at other options. And when we start looking at that, I, I think it's, you know, you have to bring in um, not only the, the hardware and software that, 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 you know, we have on it, but also the hypervisor is a big piece of kind of bringing it all together, right? And, and, um, and you know, so that's been honestly a, a huge driver over the last really almost two years of really people starting just to go from initial conversation of, you know, hey, we want to start thinking about what, what we might do, right, to all the way to moving production, everything over to like, you know, Nutanix with their AHV platform. So, you know, I, I think for sure um, there's been a lot of interest, um, you know, and it's and it's accelerating is really what we're seeing. But but it does take a bit of an inflection point at times to to find the right time to move some of that, right? And, and maybe that's a end of life on certain hardware or, um, you know, or or maybe a, a big renewal that that's coming, or something that you know forces the the, the conversation a little bit further. Um, but even, but I have a lot of customers just from a strategic perspective, like, hey, what are we doing next? You know, is it do we want to start looking at AHV? Do we want to start looking at um, you know some type of Azure Stack or something? You know, like those are the, there's there's conversations around all of it, and and customers are definitely labbing this stuff and figuring it out. Um, you know, and I, I do think I know we mentioned lightly. Kevin mentioned about the you know kind of partnership with Cisco that they're doing, but I, I have seen a big push around that too because we had a lot of customers who were leveraging UCS platforms and um, and all the other pieces around it. That I think now that that's kind of supported with with Nutanix fully, I, I, and and they kind of got out of that business, if you will, right? You know, because I think they were having some internal, you know, little 
deciding when to bring them in and not or have a conversation. So I think this is a different thing that uh, people can really, uh, you know, really choose the platform they want to be on, whether that's, um, you know, all the major players on prem or, or really every major cloud, you know, and I think that's, uh, that's something that flexibility, I think is something that I, I've seen a, a deep in conversation. So, you know, it's definitely very topical. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't expect it to slow down at all. I, I think people are, are trying to uh, understand how to, you know, maybe not put all their eggs in one basket around VM, the way they've had it with VMware and, mm -hmm. and understand that um, there are actually other really awesome solutions out there. Yep. Yeah, I think the big difference for me too is, I mean, obviously if customers are looking at Nutanix, they're replacing <laughs> their, their, their compute platform. But I think what's different now is it used to be, okay, we'll, we'll replace our storage and we'll go with Nutanix, but we still want to keep vCenter and vSphere and, 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 and that. And increasingly it's customers are, are comfortable now where their first purchase, they're going with Nutanix and they're, and they're replacing VMware completely. So where it's where they're using the Nutanix hypervisor um, and, and especially for, for Citrix workloads, because we really have the, you know, you know, Citrix is tied in with that, with everything AHV. So I think right now it's probably like four out of five new customers are going to be deploying straight to AHV and just skipping, um, VMware with Nutanix together. So that's been, I think a big change. And then, yeah, this is, so the Cisco thing, we've mentioned that a couple of times. I didn't really, I don't know if everyone's heard that news, but basically what Cisco announced about a few weeks ago is that they're um, end of lifing um, their Hyperflex product, which was their sort of hyper-converged competitor in Nutanix running on UCS. And they're instead going to basically um, OEM Nutanix running on, on UCS. So the, um, that's, that was a pretty, uh, we were really happy about that because there's a, you know, there's a lot of um, great Cisco customers and we've, we've been tracking the use, you know, trying to support UCS for, for a few years. So now this means you're going to have, you're going to have, you know, first class support with the UCS um, and a lot of Cisco sellers, um, you know, out there uh, learning, you know, learning about our stack and, and, um, and uh, recommending it. So Kevin, I'll, I'll kick one over to you here real quick. So maybe we'll tag team this one, but you know, in terms of you know VDI EUC, you know, more broadly, I guess you could say, um, you know, this is not just um, you know a great partnership between Citrix and Nutanix, but I mean, there's some integration points um, between the two solutions where they've been engineered together. In fact, um, you know, there's several certainly reference architectures out on both websites that talk about this, but. Um, let's get into some of those integration points and kind of what they do, or I guess what the what the value they bring is. So, you know, I'll start with the first one, the obvious one. You know, I think from a Citrix perspective, the idea is, you know, one UI, one interface to be able to tap into wherever these workloads live, right? So from a user perspective, you know, that's really our focus. I want you to hit one workspace and then click on workloads and they'll just get pulled in from whatever. Now, what's nice is, you know, those workloads, you know, sitting on Nutanix, you know, we've got a couple of, connectors that tie into those, but, you know, we've got native integration into AHV, so we can make specific calls out to AHV to do things like spin up desktops. And, you know, unbeknownst to Citrix in a lot of cases, there's some some secret sauce to Nutanix in terms of how it handles things like MCS, even provisioning services. But, you know, there's some some dedupe that goes on under the hood that, that actually reduces that footprint, right? Yeah, the, so I, I was at Citrix for eight years before I, I, I uh, switched over to Nutanix uh, about eight years ago in 2015. So I was a big fan of provisioning services. I, you know, to me, I always led with that with customers that wanted want to deploy at scale, right? I mean, hundreds or thousands mm -hmm. of desktops. And um, what I realized is that the way, you know, MCS, uh, the Citrix technology is very dependent on the hypervisor and the storage to be, you know, capable. Um, so uh, you know, if, if you've got the right hypervisor and the right storage system, MCS works really, really well. If your storage system can't handle it, it's not going to be a good experience, right? It's going to take too long, the, the, the higher IOPS, the latency, all those things are going to cause issues, right? So what, what, we, what I realized is going through the way Nutanix does the storage, and then when we layer in AHV, one thing that's really interesting about AHV, because it only runs on Nutanix, there's no actual storage stack part of the hypervisor. So if you think about VMware, you want to do a snapshot, right? Well, is, does the hypervisor do the snapshot or does VMware tell the storage to do the snapshot? It's actually a pretty complex question, like depending on how you have it set up, depending on the storage, depending on the vSphere version, depending on the settings, it, it can be a lot of different things. So with Nutanix, it's very simple. 
the, the storage is always going to handle the snapshots. And that's what makes sense because the storage system is really good at handling snapshots and metadata and cloning and thin provisioning and dedupe and all those kind of wonderful things. So w that's why we were able to come out with the hypervisor so fast is because we already, it only runs in the storage stack. So we don't have to deal, we don't have to deal with storage at all mm -hmm. uh, with our hypervisor. So what that means is that when, you know, we designed all these, what we call plugins, right? So that way we could, we could support, um, you know, our, uh, what we call Prism APIs. So basically our Nutanix mm -hmm. APIs can work with the Citrix APIs. So we developed these, this plugin architecture jointly. So that way Citrix manages the Citrix APIs, Nutanix manages the Nutanix APIs. We don't have to basically, um, you know, uh, step on each other's toes there. And so if there's ever, a, you know, an, uh, uh, an issue that's reported or, or a customer found um, thing, we can just quickly make the change on our side and then boom, now it's supported on all the Citrix versions. So it's not like it, whereas if you, if you find like a, uh, you know, a VMware issue, you've got to basically get Citrix mm -hmm. to fix that. And then it's going to be in the brand new version. Yeah. That's going to take you probably a year and a half to get to. So we can just fix that on our end. We've done that all the time. We've done that many times. And um, uh, so, you know, those are kind of the nice, the nice integration points. And, um, and yeah, so basically Citrix says, okay, I need a VM. And then we can handle that with MCS and we can handle that really efficiently on the storage to the point where, we can, you know, we can create a pool of thousand desktops or do those like in basically as fast, not much longer than it would take to reboot a thousand desktops uh, on VMware. So all, a lot of the, and then all the, all the um, image versioning and image tracking and replication across, you know, um, different data centers and clouds, we handle all that as well. So a lot of the traditional PVS uh, benefits, you really get that with MCS on Nutanix. And it, it gets to the point where most customers re realize it and then they say, well, I don't need to do provisioning service anymore. So that's a whole console database, you know, networking stack yeah, and servers, know, re yeah. reverse <laughs> imaging. It, I mean, yeah. DVS is really great for what it does, but if you don't need it, it's, it, it greatly simplifies um, Citrix and it makes it easier to do things like in, in the cloud and replication and Citrix cloud and all those things just work really a lot better and a lot easier, simpler. Well, I'm being told by my handlers, Kevin, that we uh, we're up on time here. So, um, listen, yeah. I appreciate it, Brian. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. To sure. Like to yeah, this was a great conversation. That's how time flies. We're having just so much fun. So, uh, all, all good there. But I want to thank everybody for joining us today, um, and, and we, we hope you learned a lot. I, I think we touched on a lot of things. Um, we're happy to dig in deeper with with each of you. Um, so, you know, we will be following up with the recording of this webinar and uh, definitely looking forward to discussing next steps. And, you know, so, well, the account managers from Gotham will be reaching out and, uh, and thanks again.